gentlemen, this is the video on limiting reactants. We're going to go through uh, two parts of a limiting reactant problem and review what the term limiting reactants actually means. So, to get started, limiting reactants, the definition. The definition of limiting reactant is essentially exactly what it sounds like. It's the reactant that is limiting, meaning the reactant in a chemical reaction that gets used up first, the one that creates less product, uh, it is essentially the thing that is controlling how much product you are going to make. Now, this is a huge, huge point. This does not necessarily mean that it's the reactant that you have fewer grams of or the reactant that you have fewer moles of. And the reason for that is because there are, it's because there are some reactants when we look at a chemical reaction, that get used up at a higher frequency. For example, every time you make a car, you're using four tires for every one steering wheel that you're uh, that goes into it. So if you have five tires and five steering wheels, although you have the same amount of each, the tires are going to get used up faster because more of them are required. So this is a really critical point. Limiting reactant does not necessarily mean the reactant that you simply have less of. It's the one that makes less product. That's a key, key, key point. And additionally, huge thing right here in bold, how to identify a limiting reactant problem. How do you know that you have a limiting reactant problem? Because, and oh, they're so tricky, the phrase limiting reactant will most likely not be used. So you can't use that. You cannot rely on the fact that it says which reaction is limiting. The problem actually won't say that. What it will say, it'll give you mole or mass information on two or more reactants. That's how we're going to know that we have a limiting reactant problem. It won't jump naked up and down in front of us. No, no, no. Instead, it'll say, if you've got 10 grams of reactant A and 20 grams of reactant B, how much product C are you going to make? That is how you will know you, that we have a limiting reactant problem. And then we go to the strategy. Once you realize that we have mass or mole information on two or more reactants, what we have to do is figure out, based on each of those numbers, how much product you can theoretically make from each one. And because once you've done that, once you've taken both of the numbers that the problem gives you, the 10 grams of reactant A, 20 grams of reactant B, and you figured out how much product C each one of those ones will get you, you've essentially already answered the question because then you look at that and you see the reactant that makes less product is your limiting reactant. And the amount of product that is made by the limiting reactant is how much is actually made. That's gonna be your, well, not actually, but that's gonna be your theoretical yield. Essentially, a limiting reactant problem, how to solve it? It's right here. It's going to be two mass-mass calculations. That is typically precisely what a limiting reaction problem is. It's simply two mass-mass calculations. So, example problem. The reaction between aluminum and iron-3 oxide produces iron and aluminum oxide, shown below. In one reaction, 124 grams of aluminum reacted with 601 grams of iron-3 oxide. Calculate the mass of aluminum oxide formed in this process. This is... Exact, this is such, such classic limiting reaction problem. And if you read through this, it does not contain the phrase limiting reactant. So that's why I'm choosing to show it to you. How do we know it's a limiting reactant problem? It's right here. If we look at the numbers. 124 grams of aluminum. 124 grams of this thing. 601 grams of iron 3 oxide. 601 grams. And it says, what is the mass of aluminum oxide? So we are looking for the mass of that. This right here, this information, this set of information means that this is a limiting reactant problem. They gave us mass data on two reactants and they asked how much product are we going to get? That is what a limiting reactant problem is going to sound like. What we're gonna do is figure out how much aluminum oxide we're gonna get from this number in one mass mass problem, and we're gonna figure out how much aluminum oxide we're gonna get from this number in a second mass mass problem. We're going to figure out for each of these reactants how much product we're gonna make. Whichever one makes less product, that's the limiting reactant, and would be the answer to the question, meaning however much product the limiting reactant makes is how much aluminum oxide is going to be theoretically formed. So, two mass mass problems. All right, so let's do the aluminum first. So we're going to take the 124 grams. It's just mass, mass. So it's mass to moles, 124 grams of AL. 
every mole of aluminum weighs 27 grams. Okay, so massed moles. Now we're gonna turn the moles of aluminum into moles of aluminum oxide. This is one, sorry, mole of aluminum oxide. And this is using the coefficients, so I'm looking at the two and the one. One mole of aluminum oxide, and then because it is asking for mass of aluminum oxide, I am going to take it um, out to mass. So one mole of aluminum oxide weighs 102 grams. So do that math. Grams of aluminum cancels, moles of aluminum cancels, moles of aluminum oxide cancels, and we see that from the 124 grams of aluminum that we can make 234 grams of aluminum oxide. Great! We're halfway there. This is just for the aluminum. For We're going to do the exact same thing for the iron 3 oxide. We're going to figure out how much product we can make from that amount of aluminum oxide. We are not assuming that simply because there are fewer grams of aluminum that it will uh, be the limiting reactant. We don't know that. That's not the way it works. The limiting reactant is the reactant that produces less product. So we're going to figure out how much product each one of them makes. So I'm going to go through the exact same thing. I'm going to figure out how many grams of aluminum oxide, saying product, I'm going to get from this amount of iron 3 chloride. Uh, so the 159.8 grams is the molar mass of iron 3 oxide. So I'm turning mass to moles for the iron 3 oxide, then I'm going to turn moles to moles. Notice how I'm always filling out the bottom part of my t-chart first, because I'm always concerned with unit cancellation. I always want to cancel whatever unit that I just filled in on the top. Always how we do dimensional analysis. All right, so now again using the coefficients to turn moles of aluminum oxide again into that, I'm sorry, moles of iron 3 oxide into moles of aluminum oxide. And then turning it back into mass, because the problem is asking for mass. One mole of Al2O3 becomes, uh, has a mass of 102 grams. Units cancel, grams of iron 3 oxide cancel, moles of iron 3 oxide cancel, moles of aluminum oxide cancel, and do the math. And I get uh, 384 grams of aluminum oxide. We are 95% done with the problem at this point. So what we've done thus far is determine how much product we can get from each of these two amounts of reactant individually. Two numbers means two t-charts. You can look at it just like that. So now we can essentially evaluate the response and actually answer the question. We look at the numbers. Which reactant made less product? This one. This one. 234 is less than 384. We do not actually make this. This one is in excess. So our limiting reactant is aluminum. Now, that's good, we've identified that, but ask, actually answer the question, what is the mass of aluminum oxide, right, because that's what it's looking for, mass of aluminum oxide formed, it's this number right here. You've already figured it out. You've already done the mass, the math. There are 234 grams of aluminum oxide formed because you've determined that the aluminum is the limiting reactant and 124 grams of aluminum can only make 234 grams of aluminum oxide. You've answered the question through doing these two uh, t-charts. Part two, this is the same problem, same numbers. To follow up, so it's the same introduction, I'll point out where it's different, right here. How much of the excess reagent is left at the end of the reaction. Now there's a reason that this is part two. We're going to use all of our work from part one. And I'll remind you right here, what has part one told us? Part one has told us that aluminum is, sorry, aluminum, it is the limiting reactant, and it makes 234 grams of Al2O3. It, uh, part one has told us that Fe2O3 is in excess, and it theoretically 
makes uh, 384 grams of, of aluminum oxide. This question is saying how much of the excess reagent, so that's the Fe2O3, that's what we're going to be looking for, is left at the end of the reaction. So the aluminum is limiting, meaning it gets completely used up. It'll be completely consumed in order to create the 234 grams of aluminum oxide. But we're still going to have some Fe2O3 left over at the end of the reaction. This question is saying how much. Now I want to be very clear at this point. There are multiple approaches to, to solving limiting reactant problems. Multiple strategies. To me, this is the strategy that makes the most sense. If you see another way, if another way makes sense to you and it's stoichiometrically legitimate, meaning you're not just kind of pulling numbers out of thin air to solve it, that it makes sense based on the mole ratios, then you can do it another way. This is the way that makes sense to me. And the way that makes sense to me, in order to figure out the excess reagent, is to take the difference between these two numbers. 384 grams from the Fe2O3 minus the 234 grams from the Al. And here's what taking the difference says. It says that between the two, we get 150 grams of Al2O3, right? This is, these are both Al2O3 masses. They're just coming from different sources. That's in excess, right? Because you should be able to make 384 grams from the iron 3 oxide, 234 grams from the aluminum, so the difference between them is essentially directly related to the amount of excess that's left over. So let's subtract the two values that we got before. We're basically using the work that we've already did. Using those numbers, we have 150 grams of product that's in excess. We're going to work backwards. And what we're going to do is turn that excess product into excess reactant. Through a mass mass problem. And that's all we have to do. A mass mass problem with this as our starting point. This amount of excess product. We're going to turn that into the amount of excess reactant. 150 grams. In this case, now it's product, Al2O3. We're going to work backwards and figure out that's sort of the leftovers, the extra that does not actually get made. We're going to work backwards and figure out what that translates into in terms of the extra reactants. So Al2O3, 102 grams. This is a simple mass-mass problem. Mass to moles. First step. Going to do moles to moles using the coefficients. One mole of Al2O3. Getting coefficients, things are re rewritten here. One to one. One mole Fe2O3. And then turn moles back into mass using GFM of Fe2O3. 59.8 grams. And grams cancels, moles cancel. Moles of Fe2O3 cancel, and 235 grams of Fe2O3 in excess. And this answers the second part of the problem. There are multiple approaches to this. This is not the way that you have to do it, but this is the way that makes the most sense to me, mostly because it's using the work that we already did, and this is sort of the key point right here, using the work that we already did in part one as our starting point for part two. Because you don't want to have to start from scratch every single time. Then, then you're essentially wasting your time, and as you're going to see, you're not going to have a lot of time on a lot of these free response problems. Um, so that is the limiting reactants type of question. I hope this helps when you're looking at the homework or when you're reviewing for the test.